Hey guys, it's Eric with the Miller Park Minute, where we're throwing strikes and getting likes, hitting dingers and getting listeners back again with another episode. Uh, this is the promised special guest episode, and I can finally reveal that we have our promised special guest here. Uh, this is your only Brewers Daily Podcast. 5.30 every morning is our upload time. You can catch us on YouTube, Spotify, Google, Amazon, CastBox, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and anchor without further ado we've got our special guest in the waiting he's a busy guy i don't want to keep him waiting he is the brewers play-by-play announcer this is his second full season uh being our announcer he is also a broadcaster for the big 10 network and fox sports does college basketball and without further ado i am going to bring in our guest jeff levering today Welcome to the show, Jeff. Hey, Eric. Thanks, man. Great intro, by the way. Thank Very you. Well thank done. you. Uh, I, I've I've modeled myself after uh, a famous podcaster that I uh, enjoy listening to that does the football side of things. So I'm trying to do that on the baseball th- side of things if I could grow this thing at some point. Uh, hopefully, we're doing our part here to uh, to get some listenership in there. Doing a nice yes, job. I mean, exactly. you're on every well, platform that's what available. I mean, so. I, I come here to have baseball conversations. That's Good. what I do every day. I mean, I, I do this once a day. I talk to different people. Sometimes I block them all into like a Monday. Sometimes I block them into a Tuesday. You know, whatever. I, I try and fit them in where I can. So I put a lot of work in. I've been on YouTube since two thousand oh, four year, four or five years now. So it's been a while. That's good, um, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate having me on. So you're in the process of kind of getting ready. Obviously, you told me kind of when we scheduled this thing, I'll, we'll peek behind the curtain, that uh, you had a lot going on up until the big game. So now, where are you in the process? Obviously, they don't broadcast. You don't have broadcasts to go on for another couple weeks, right? I mean, week or two? Yeah, so our first broadcast is going to be on the 25th. So it's the first game of spring training against the Dodgers. So we'll be on TV that day. Uh, but yeah, I, I had five games in the matter of eight days um, when we were trying to set something up. So I, I was kind of out of commission there for a little bit. Now I'm taking this week to just reconnect with my family a little bit. I have, you know, wife and two kids, one eight and one five. And I'm going to be gone away from them for about a month for spring training then they'll come down and hang out for the last week of spring training. But uh, it's just important for me to, to step away a little bit and make sure I had some some QT with the fam before heading down. I leave on the 20th, uh, and then I'll, I'll report to Arizona on the 22nd. So I'll get a couple of days watching practice. I think Major League Baseball is, is doing a little seminar about the rules changes, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. They're going to walk us through the, the extra base sizes and what the pitch clock's going to look like and explain all the – how many disengagements you can have from the rubber and all these different things. So uh, that'll be a good thing coming up uh, a couple of days before we have our first broadcast. So just taking a little bit of time before we hit the ground. Right. Spring. It's kind of ease yourself in, right? I mean, especially with going into a, a season with rule changes, I'm sure on the broadcast side, you've got to be the audio explanation of that. I mean, I've gone through them three, four times now, and I, I still don't think I can, I could rattle them off the top of my head. So that's probably a new factor for you guys. Yeah, it is. And they've been tinkering with the rules a lot here recently, uh, probably the last five years. And, and going back, I don't know, four or five years when they implemented the you don't have to throw four pitches outside the, outside the strike zone for an intentional walk, right? You know, they do is put the four fingers up. And I remember doing the first game that that was implemented in spring training. And I was working with Yuke on the radio and Yuke's like, what the heck is happening? What, why can he just take first base? Well, you, you can just put up four fingers. You don't have to throw four wide ones anymore. And he gets first base. I don't understand these rules. Why are we messing with baseball? And now it's going to be no shifting and you have X amount of time to throw the pitch. It, it's going to be a fascinating way to watch baseball this year. I know that. Right. I, I don't necessarily like I've got, grown to the conclusion. Initially, I was kind of like all grumbly about it, but I've grown to the conclusion that uh, with time, it will just it'll just be second nature of the game. Yeah, well, and I think spring training and, and it proved a lot last year in the minor leagues how how quickly a game can change. I can think they cut off 25 minutes of the average game time last year in the minor leagues. I think that's great for our sport. Uh, it'll create a little sense of urgency. We'll say the one rule change that I was not a fan of 
is they took away the ghost runner. I, I really starting in extra innings. I, I was really starting to like that rule at first. I thought it was really hokey, um, but it did quicken games. You see players not lose their jobs because they have to throw six innings out of a bullpen. Uh, guys get optioned. I mean, that happens. That was a real life thing that happened in the sport. Um, and it created a sense of urgency and instant action and extra innings. I, I, I liked it. And now it's going away. And I, I don't love the fact. I, I have news for you on that, actually. Oh, breaking news? Breaking news on that. I just read this before we started here. Oh. Uh, it looks like MLB has voted to keep the Ghost Drummer runner permanent for all regular season games yes look at that. eric you are breaking news right now i was right. man good for you thank you for that I, that just made I my day in. i i i i have just about every mlb <laughs> notification on on my phone so i get i get just about everything eric thank you for that again no joke you just made my day i think that <laughs> fan, fans really appreciate it of course with every fan base, you're going to have 50% of people that like it, 50% of people that don't like it. Um, I was all in favor of it. And if you're trying to speed up the game, why are you taking that rule away? Because then you're extending games. You're going 18 in it, whatever it is. Um, I like that they're keeping it. You're, you're saving your extra inning, guys, and your, your, your bullpen, and you're getting to that point where you don't have to use that starter. And I think that's one of the things in the modern game of baseball, you know, when they throw the starter out to the bullpen, you know, this guy's pitching four days from now and they got to put a right. starter in, you know, you're, you're kind of wrecking the game a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And again, if you, if you've got that last guy in your bullpen, who's throwing three innings, you know, he's not going to be available tomorrow. He's probably getting optioned. If he doesn't have any options left, he's going to get DFA would and you're, you're losing your job and that's unfortunate. And I think baseball's done a nice job to get away from that with that rule. Now, and you you came up um, through Boston, and originally were introduced to us with uh, with Bob Uecker. Um, do you, your path is just is 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 great in the fact that you got to experience Mister Baseball, the legend himself, kind of kind of right out of the gate. Was that rough to start with, or was that kind of a perfect way to come into Milwaukee to do play by play? Uh, I mean, it's intimidating. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I will say that I had the best of both worlds where when I initially got the job in 2015, I was not Uke's partner. Um, I was the number three guy, so I would just do the road games that Uke didn't do. So I never worked with Bob in my entire first year, um, but I got a master's class from him every single night at home games because I would go to every game and he'd when he's not doing play by play, just walk up the steps and we would just chit chat for three innings, four innings at a time. And I, I really got to know him. He really got to know me. And I think that that really helped going into 2016 when I took over as the, the lead number two guy. And then when Bob was not on the call for road games, I was the lead play by play guy on the radio with, with Lane and now Lane and Josh. And, and I kind of have all of the distinction there, but it's, um, it's not an easy thing to do to work with a guy like that, but he makes it so easy on his partners. Um, and the easiest thing that I had to learn was just to shut up. You know, you just you just be quiet and you learn the way that he calls a game. You watch the way he calls a game. You learn how to set him up because nobody wants to hear the other guy. And for my first five years in the big leagues, I was just the other guy. I was. You know, it's you can whoever he's working with, Uke's partner. Sure. And that was great. I wish I had business cards that were written as just Uke's partner. Um, because that's amazing. But it, it's more, hey, listen, how can I get more out of Bob? Nobody cares about what I'm saying. If Bob needs help with something, he'll ask me and we'll just chit chat about it. We'll get him through it. Um, if he's in the middle of a story, if it's a bad game, how can I poke the bear to get more out of his story? So that those are the things that you learn as you work with Bob, but it's it's not intimidating to work with him necessarily. It was intimidating the first time he tossed it to me for the play by play, and you're like, oh my god, why is Bob Euchre tossing it to me for an inning of baseball? This is stupid. What alternate reality am I in? Um, but once I got over that, it was just okay. It's just the same game. I'm working with a, a Hall of Famer and probably the best who's ever done it, and you just. He's more of a friend than anything else, and that's the best part about about you and, and the way that he goes about his business. 
Sure, and it, it very much when you when you listen to Euchre on the radio, it doesn't seem like the guy is second fiddle. He just just it, most of the time, like you said, you let Bob talk because yeah, we we're getting as much of Bob as we can right now, even if it's not all the games. We're still getting him, so we got to enjoy it and suck it up. And I think everybody around him probably knows that. Yeah, now you yeah. transferred you transferred over to the TV side, uh, but you still you, you are you going to dance the line in twenty twenty three? You know, based on BA's schedule, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we have BA's schedule yet. His his schedule is kind of day to day. It's not as not as set in stone as Ukes is. Sometimes Ukes is, I mean, every home game, and if he decides he wants to go on a road trip, he'll go on a road trip. Uh, but BA, he's going to do about the same as he did last year. So I did 110 games on TV, and BA did 50, and he'll do 50 again this year. And for the games that BA is on TV, I'll do radio with either Lane or Josh or Uke or whatever it works out. And that's just how it is. I, I All I need to know is whether I'm wearing a Valley Sports Wisconsin polo or if I need to wear um, a sport coat or dress-up shirt. Um, just let me know what I need to wear. And then I'll figure right. out what booth I'm going into. It's okay. We'll be fine. So when you when – you, uh, now, now you're going into spring training mode – when do you really plug yourself in to get ready for baseball? Obviously you've been doing basketball. Um, when do you get the, uh, the baseball stripes ready and get out your uh, tablet and cruise your baseball knowledge? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of dialed in the entire off season. I'm not a hundred percent invested in it. You know, I'm doing other things, did football and did a lot of college basketball, so, you know, you're grinding on that kind of stuff, but I'm, I'm listening to the signings that are happening and the trades that have been going on and coming on podcasts. And I have to sound like I know what I'm talking about a little bit. So, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty dialed in with what's going on with the Brewers the entire off season, but now that the basketball is over, I'm going to give myself a couple of days um, just to let my brain be a, pu- a puddle of mush um, and just hang out with the fam a bit, but I'll, sure. I'll probably dial in over the course of the weekend and, you know, once you get down to spring training, you're showing up. It's it's having the conversations in the clubhouse and watching batting practice and you know watching bullpens and and that's how you really get to know people. Anyways, is having conversations with them and um, and a lot of the core of of what's coming back to the Brewers are guys that have been there for a number of years too. Hopefully, that's not too loud. They're trimming a tree down out of the, my front yard. <laughs> Oh no, man! I was like, man, what's going on out there? I don't want to jump in there with a chainsaw and help them. <laughs> yeah, <they're, laughs> they marked them for today, and I was like, oh man, no! Of course, this would be the day. You know, whatever. Oh, you're good. You're good um, do you do you have like a set routine every day at spring training? Do you go and hey, I'm gonna go make sure I talk to the pitchers, and I'm gonna go watch some batting practice, that kind of thing? How does that how does that work out? Yeah, it's it's I think in the beginning when I was first starting, it was really important to me to make sure that people could see me. Right. And and I heard a great adage when I got to the big leagues and, and I kind of was like this in the minor leagues, too, that you should always as a broadcaster be available. Right. If you want someone because I was the media relations guy in the minor leagues, too, among other millions of things that I was doing, Um but if you're standing there at the cage and you're watching batting practice, if you want to go have a conversation with somebody, sometimes it's best to have them come to you. Um, and it's one of those things where you are seen but not heard. You're there, and if people want to come up and chat with you, you say, hey, what's going on? Don't have an agenda um, and have a specific question to ask sometimes. Sometimes it's just, hey, how's the family? What's going on? What are you working on? It's those those really basic conversations that go a long way and allows you to get to know people. Um, but it's the, hey, be seen and not heard. Know that you're available. So going into spring training, it's walking around the clubhouse, saying hi, introducing yourself to people. And then when you get on the field, it's, hey, I'm here. And if you want to chat, let's chat. If you don't want to chat, you don't have to. I'm just going to watch what you're doing and, and just be an observer. I think that that's a, a really important quality to have, not sticking your nose in, in other people's business sometimes. Right, right. You want to, you want to, you want to kind of get some some information from watching them swing or what they're working on. So right. later when they're batting, you, you know, you don't necessarily have to ask. Well, is your shoulder hurting you? But you want to kind of have 
observed that they may have changed something or sure sure and those are conversations where if you're watching them swing you go hey what'd you what'd you do in the off season right what, what were the what was your process like how did you do this you look like you bulked up a little bit what was your workout regimen just just things like that so those are those are really important things for me again my family's going to come down so i'll i'll if i'm off i'll take a day off uh i think that's a really important thing too to, to just get away because we do so many games anyway um it's 162 games in 181 days so any opportunity i'll get to get a little bit of r and i'm going to take it right right and 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 that's a i'm sure that's a big part of it um now is it is a i would assume you're a baseball fan as well right oh yeah so yeah. as a fan did you initially follow the Brewers? Were you you? I know you're from California, so did you have a team? Is it different to work for a team that you didn't follow versus what you did, or do you just kind of become a fan as you as you move along? You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I've always been a fan of the sport. I mean, I, and I played baseball all the way through college, and so I mean, I, I'm emotionally invested in the sport, and I always have been. Um, I think it's a beautiful game and it's one that um, I hope kids can learn to love again. I feel like kids have not grown up in this era because they don't have the patience to to follow baseball because it takes a long time. But um, I, I love it. I, I grew up a, a San Francisco Giants fan because I grew up in Sacramento. I was 90 minutes away from Candlestick Park. So I, I grew up a Giants fan, loved Will Clark. Um, I knew about the Brewers but they weren't in the American league. They weren't in the national league. So I never had a chance to really see them. And I, I root a little bit for the A's, but not a ton. Um, but I knew who Robin Yount was. I knew who Paul Molitor was. Uh, if you had asked me who Gorman Thomas was, I could no, I don't know who Gorman Thomas was, but then you get to know him and realize that he came through Sacramento before he got to Milwaukee and he did 52 homers at Solon stadium where I played. So you, those are things that kind of, that kind of, assimilate me with the organization and then it, it's kind of poetic that my last collegiate at bat ever came in the state of wisconsin and appleton at the college world series so now that my big league career is here too there's a, a nice little symbolism but you know it, i've worked in four different organizations now i started working in the angels organization in a ball then i went to the cardinals organization in double a then you mentioned the red sox as the red sox in triple a for two years and now i've been with the brewers this is going into year number nine and being an employee of the club, I mean, yeah, you're invested in this. And I I am so lucky to be a part of this run that the Brewers are on. This is the most success they've ever had consecutively. And I know the Brewers didn't make the playoffs last year, missed it by a game. But they've played a grand total of three games that haven't had playoff implications in the last five years. Since 2017, three games total that haven't had playoff implications. So I, I am super lucky to, to be a fan of this team and they've got great characters that you can root for and great personalities you can root for and a homegrown guy who's the manager and Craig council. I mean, who doesn't love that? So I I've become a huge fan of the brewers. My kids are brewers fans. They don't know anything different. Um, they, they wear the the blue and the yellow and the, all the new swag and they're all in on the brewers train. I think you actually mentioned that during a radio broadcast last season, you were talking about, uh, I got I got to load the kids up with some new stuff at the uh, the store down in Arizona. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I mean they haven't been my kids haven't been down to Arizona since 2020 when the world shut down. So oh geez, you know yeah. they'll all they'll love it and you know it'll be a fun credit card build. Well, you probably just gotta fit that around spring spring break. You kind of bring them all down that kind of thing. For yeah, try to now that now that both are in school and you know, before we could go down the whole time they weren't in school and now that they're older and wiser and they need to stay in school that's important for them it's good for the schedule it's good for the sanity to have them in school right <laughs> for sure yeah i agree i totally agree my kid was home on friday and, and that drives me nuts uh so i'm gonna ask you about the team now yeah uh, what do you got, got a little, little of your knowledge out of the way uh what do you think about freddie peralta this year being a kind of a like a comeback of the year type candidate um kind of a guy that we we can see go from half of what everybody else had to a full season now. Yeah, I think Freddie, I mean, he was so good in 2021, right? I mean, a really unsung season that year. He really developed the slider, and last year he had the curveball. 
that he added to the mix. Uh, the changeup is a pitch that's been so big for him. I, I think Freddie's biggest key is just to stay healthy. And and we could tell last season with that shoulder, it just never was what it was uh, from 2021. It's a work thing. It's a work usage thing. You know, coming off of 2020, and you could see that with a number of pitchers, you know, with their usage ramping up so much, it's almost coming off of an injury um from 2020 to 2021 and then 2022 you're you're just trying to continue that workload when it was already diminished two years prior so i think there were a lot more injuries on the pitching side of things not just the brewers just the whole major league baseball thing um but i think it's really important for him to come in and and feel good it's a good decision i think for him not to pitch in the world baseball classic he can just continue to work on what he needs to work on now they're in ashby who's going to be slow to get going in the spring, Matt Arnold was talking about that last week. Uh, I think it's really important for Freddie to have a consistent workload and to stay healthy and stay diligent. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the Brewers do a, a six-man rotation again this year just because of the additions that they have. They had so much success with it in 2021. Um, so I, I think Freddie is a, a huge linchpin when you've got Corbin and Brandon Woodruff. And I think Wade Miley is a great addition, Eric Lauer, Hauser. And Freddie, I mean, it's a it's a great rotation, and it frees up Aaron Ashby to kind of work his way into whatever role he's going to be in, whether it's a starter or a long reliever or whatever it is. Uh, it's a nice soft landing for Aaron, but but Freddie is a, a big linchpin and part of that, right? And I think I think it goes with kind of what we've been doing for the last several years, with uh, you know even Corbin Burns uh, when they when they made the big jump to use these three young guys. To start, Corbin Burns kind of did that bullpen role for a little bit. Josh Hader did some some different innings when Josh Hader was a part of the team and when mm -hmm. Josh Hader came up first. So I, I think it's good um, to have that flexibility to move these guys around, especially with a Aaron Ashby or, uh, you know, Freddie Peralta's done it at times, you know. Yeah, Freddie was a starter at 18 and then kind of yo-yoed around in 19 and even a little bit of 20. So I, it's not a... It's not unheard of. Uh, it happens in Major League Baseball. The Brewers are as good as anybody about doing that. Brandon, like you mentioned, Corbin Burns did it. Brandon Woodruff did it. Um, Aaron Ashby is probably going to do it. I, I think it's just a, a great way to get your your toes wet in the big leagues. Um, get big league innings. Get big league hitters. Go through segments and say, okay, these are the guys that you're going to face. X, Y, Z. How are you going to do that? And then come back two days later and do it again and ramp up. It's just a, it's a great way to go about modeling your pitching program. I think Chris Hook and Walker McKinvin and those guys in the, in the pitching lab do an amazing job at, at getting these pitchers ready to go year in and year out. Now, do you get to see like a little bit of, I'm sure you, since you're there and you, you get to enjoy and watch the whole thing and it's part of your job. Um, do you get to see these guys uh, progress from day one of when you get to camp to, you know, when, you, when you're packing up to get to Milwaukee for the first game? Yeah, sure. I mean, they are going to, I think they report on the 15th, right? So you got, you got pitchers and catchers reporting. Those guys have been throwing though for the last six weeks. There, there is really no off season for big leaguers these days. Hitters are maybe they shut it down for six weeks and then they're, they're ramping it up as soon as the new year, uh, new year gets going and working on their swings, taking ground balls or pitching, just getting their arms ready to go. Um, so it, it's more just about the buildup, right? So spring training, it's not, okay, well, a couple of years ago, Freddie was working on that slider. So he shows up and he's working on that slider in a spring training game. Or uh, Brandon Woodruff was really intentional about making sure he worked in his two-seam fastball a couple seasons ago. Corbin was working on his cutter going into 2021. So it's all just different things to try and get better and try and tweak. And they're so intentional about it in these spring training games because they know they don't matter. I mean, you go look at spring training stats and you got Clayton Kershaw has got a 21 ERA and then – he goes out and throws a one hitter in, on opening day. Nobody cares about spring training. It's just how you feel. Um, and it is fun to see them flip that switch, right? You see the great pitchers go one outing and they give up 10 and they got to roll innings and these things and they're all pissed off. And the next time out, they're pitching with a little bit of red under their backside and they're all dialed in again. You go, okay, all is right in the world. We're going to be okay. It's fun to see them flip that switch as a, as a competitor. 
Right, right. And and that's kind of the fun to to getting to see spring of training yeah. and be there in person a couple of years back, uh twenty eighteen. I went in person. I was gonna go in twenty twenty, but the world shut down, obviously. Yeah. Um uh, but it's it's kind of that's the fun part of this time of year is you don't know what to expect. And I think going in there's a lot of unexpected with our team. Uh we've made some new ads. Um out of the new guys, who are you most excited to uh see Donna a Brewer's uniform, you know, it may be a Jesse Winker or Will uh, William. Not yeah, Brewer. that's Careful. gonna be a tough one. Is that gonna be, have you been practicing that? Uh, yeah, yeah, Bill a little Sun? bit, not as much as I practiced uh, American Family Field as opposed to Miller Park, <laughs> um, but certainly, but certainly saying William instead of Wilson. Now they're gonna be playing against each other in the same division, so it's gonna be even worse. Um, but I, I think William's the guy that that I'm really excited to see. Uh, just because it's a great story. We saw him last year with Atlanta, and I, I think he's going to hit a ton. Uh, the work that he's going to put in defensively with Charlie Green and the rest of the catching group, um, watching his progress and catching this pitching staff is is going to be brilliant. And having Victor Caratini back there to, to kind of help him out, he did a nice job last season too. Um, I, I think he's a guy that I want I want to see a lot of. I want to see a lot of the young kids. I want to see Bryce Terang play. He'll probably play in every single game in the spring. I'm excited to see Sal Freelich get in there. Uh, even Joey Weimer. We saw Garrett Mitchell and how well he flies around the outfield. Um, the young outfielders, I'm, I'm intrigued. And I, I love the fact they brought in the local kid, Owen Miller. Um, I've been hearing about Owen Miller. For our stats guy for a long time was Mike Faulkner, and they were good family friends with the Miller family. So we've been hearing about Owen Miller since he was in high school. Um, and now that he gets to wear a Brewers uniform, it's a cool story and a, and a guy that uh, it's going to help this team quite a bit. And even having a, another Brian Anderson. I mean, how many times are you going to hear Brian Anderson talk about Brian Anderson and that story is going to go forever? Oh, uh, and, ho great. and hopefully B.A., the big B.A., that's Brian the player, because uh, little Brian is the announcer. Uh, hopefully big B.A. has a, a really good season, too. <laughs> that's that's awesome. <laughs> I, did, I, I mean, I, obviously, we see you guys on TV, so you're all adjusted to the right. You know, you all look like you're the same height. So we don't rock rock is massive. Um, rock is he's a big man and he's got a big squash too. So we, we play some, some fun with TV and angles. So I'm always like, again, I'm five ten. BA is five, seven or eight. Um, so he has a little stool that he stands on next to rock. I just kind of sit, I have a abnormally large torso and really short legs. So I can look, like I'm as big as rock almost. Um, so I can sit on the, on the, the desk area and, and rock and I kind of look okay. He's still looking down at me, which is fine, but I have to make sure that my head is a little bit ahead of his. Otherwise his head looks abnormally large compared to mine. He goes, you make sure you're a little bit in front of me. Okay. Yeah. We just got to make it look good. Yeah. Well, fun with Sophia angles. is so tiny. Yeah, she's she's like five one, five two. Yeah, she's tiny. But then she puts on the big heels, and she's five five. So, right, it all works out in the end. Yeah, I remember the first time. The first time I met her, I was like, "Oh my gosh, you're tiny." I'm si I'm six <laughs> two. So, well, you yeah, be looking down on me it's too. Funny. It's it's so funny when you when you when you look at these the the team that we've got, and it's it's really like you guys are like a family. Yeah. I mean, it really is from from everybody. I mean, David Dom was saying that when I was talking to him, and he's he's not necessarily a voice on the broadcast. You know what I mean? He's, yeah, but it feels like he is. He's our yeah. he's our stats guy, and he's in there, and he makes us sound way smarter than we are. Dom is so dialed in, and he's going to be a big league broadcaster at some point in his career, uh, in the very near future too. He's he's just yeah. he's got all the talent in the world, but but we are it doesn't matter what industry you're in, uh, whether you're a player or a broadcaster, or if you sell insurance or if you do whatever it is, you have to like the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have a great group of people that we work with. We have an awesome crew that does not just the brewers and the bucks here locally, but they do national packages for Fox and CBS and all the big networks. Uh, it's an extremely talented group. Um, the players, I think that's one thing that Craig Council does is he creates an atmosphere where people like each other. There aren't those riffs. You don't have a lot of turds in the clubhouse. There haven't been in, in Craig's tenure because he just won't stand for it. 
So it just seems like everybody, it's like a big family in the Brewers organization. Yeah. We all look as fans. And, yeah. It's great. You know, that's what yeah, I enjoy a, about it. I yeah, think it's a great it, place you, to be. You enjoy the relationships. They're like, um, kind of the guys screwing around, uh, you know, when the camera's on them and they're in the dugout, you know, that stuff that you see and you get to get the play by play of from you or Brian or it's that, but that's real life. That's who they are. You know, they're yeah. doing that when they get off the bus in the middle of the night, getting into Pittsburgh after a long game in St. Louis. Right. The, I mean, one of my favorite moments over the last couple of years, Luis Urias, who's like a little brother to everybody on the roster. Um, whenever we get into a, a city, someone is carrying this massive boom box, right? So we'll be in the hotel lobby and people are checking in and getting their keys and doing their stuff, waiting for the elevators. And whoever's carrying the boom box turns it up to 11 and they play one song. I don't know what the name of the song is. It's a great song. And they put the boom box down and they make Luis Urias dance in the middle of the lobby. It is the funniest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. It's either in the lobby or before we're getting on the plane. That's and amazing. it's just, uh, it's at 11. It's amazing. It's a great thing to watch. They love each other. See, I every time you get a little bit more inside, the more you talk to people. When I talked to Dario, Dario mentioned that uh, um, Wade Miley brings a box of wine on the on the planes. Oh, sure. I mean, Matt Albers used to bring a whole full wine cooler. I mean, it was a whole suitcase full of wine. Um yeah, there's 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 really good stories. Really good stories. It's a lot of fun. A little hidden things in baseball that you don't see in the but you guys gotta have that. I mean, otherwise, you know, I'm sure it gets pretty mundane at certain times, you know. All right, hotel, airport, ballpark, back and forth, right? Yeah, it can be. It can be. Um, you gotta break it up a little bit, make it more entertaining than it is. Yeah, for sure. You have to. I mean, I like I used to play a lot of golf on the road. Um, I, you know, I, I like to run a lot. It's a great way to see the city that you're that you're visiting. So I'll I'll go for runs in the morning and find other local eateries and try and find local places to go i mean you, you have to do all that stuff otherwise you drive yourself crazy and you're just sitting in a hotel room and it's it's groundhog day basically with the exception of the game which is different every single day but right. you have to have some sort of a routine to to keep yourself from from going crazy out of out of all the personalities that are currently in the clubhouse um who is your your favorite on-field personality right now I mean, how can you go away from Willie? I would assume it was Willie. I, right? Raptor's gone. Uh, yeah, I love Brent, Brent, man. He was the best. Raptor was great. Unfortunately, Gosh, he was the you best. Know, you lose a guy like that, and I think everybody gets a little sad. Yeah, he, he's just such a, such a great human being uh, and, a, and just a, a lightning rod of a personality, right? The guy never seemed like he'd have a bad day. Um, and he had some bad days last year, but you'd never, never be able to tell. Um, I, I loved watching Brent pitch and now that, that Wade's back, you know, at least you get that tempo back, which is great. Um, but I will, uh, Willie watching Willie play and his enthusiasm for the game and how much he loves it and how much he loves his teammates and the conversations he has in the clubhouse and in the dugout or with a catcher or somebody who gets to second base as he's playing shortstop. He just plays with a genuine enthusiasm and he loves the sport and it's not fake like that. You can tell when people are kind of trying too hard to enjoy themselves and they're mm -hmm. acting that, that you could see that you could spot a fake in this sport. You do it too right. many damn times. Willie is genuinely one of the best human beings you'll ever come around. And I hope he's in Milwaukee for a really long time. I know it's a lot of decisions they have to make up in the ivory towers of American family field, but it is uh Willie's a difference maker, whatever clubhouse he's in. Right. And I think that's one of the things that, that we get to see and get to watch. I saw a clip on my cup clip where um, he was talking to a council in the dugout and he said something about uh council. He said something about council having two rings mm -hmm. and then uh, Council said, yeah, I gave one to my dad. And, uh, you know, he, just his joking nature and how fun he is in that conversation. It's like the 
You gotta love that. A guy that yeah. loves baseball, he's just goofing around with Craig Council, saying yeah. funny crap to him. Yeah. Hey, Hefe, you got you got two rings, man. Yeah, I got two. <laughs> and Craig's just deadpan too. And and Willie goes, big ones. Yeah. 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 They're big ones. <laughs> Big World Series rings, <laughs> right? Actually, Craig was on the. Uh, they they are bringing back the Marlins colors. I don't know if you saw that. Thank goodness, man! Like, the old Mar- the old Florida Marlins. Yeah, yeah. The teal. They're, they're bringing back the teal, and Good. Uh, Craig was like right on the the front of the social media clip for it, and I was like, "Oh, that's great! I love that." Uh, those are, I think, those are my favorite Marlins uniforms when they when they first came out. The teal, and all I think about is Charlie Huff and Jeff Conine, right? So they had the teal cap with the with the black brim, and maybe it's because I played for the Marlins for a season when I was like fourteen, uh, mm-hmm. thirteen or fourteen, and I, I mean, I just loved that look, the F with the Marlin jumping out. It's a great look. I'm glad they're going back to it. I have I have a little league hat that's got out on it as well. So we good. don't do those in Little League anymore. I coach my kids' team, and it's just now it's just the city. So I'm from Fond du Lac, so it's just a big F. Uh, oh, but really? Yeah, back, in the, back in the day, we had we had like the Yankees, and we we had the Marlins. Right. It was fun. It was fun. For you sure. got to be a major leaguer. Yeah, our uh, our little league is minor league teams. Oh, okay. So uh, my kid, uh, my son was uh, what was he? He was a uh, Fort Wayne Tin Cap. He was a scrapper, Mahoning Valley scrapper. Uh, he was a Charleston River Dog, and I think my daughter was a Timber Rattler last year, so that was fun. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, a little, little, little Wisconsin connection. Yeah, it's great. The um, the fun part, I think, right now is we we've got a lot of good news coming. You know, we're 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 on the cusp, and what I would expect of Craig Council extension. Uh, Craig has been been around for what feels like forever. If you're a Brewers fan, mm-hmm. what how are how's your relationship with Craig, and uh, how is it like? What do you what do you expect to see? Like, do you think he'll stay around even if maybe they don't bring him back as uh, manager? So, Craig and my relationship is a good one. Um, it's funny when I got hired in 2015, Ron Renicky was the manager, yet. I never called a regular season game with Ron as the manager. Um, he was gone by the time I made my big league debut in, in the middle of May uh, in Detroit. So Craig had a couple of weeks. Uh, I had done spring training that year, but but not a regular season game. So Craig and I have been peered the same amount of time as he's been the manager and I've been a broadcaster. So uh, we've spent a lot of time together. I've interviewed him a ton. We have a very good relationship. Um, you know, when he was a player, he um, he had the nickname of Grumpy because um, he could be a little snarky with the the writing guys and the media. Um, and he can still be that way a little bit. But the the fact of the matter is, he is so smart. And nine times out of ten, he's the smartest guy in the room. Uh, but he doesn't act that way, which is great. And I appreciate all of the conversations that I've had with Craig. Um, I can ask him pretty much anything and, and he's a pretty straight shooter. Um, if you ask a dumb question, he'll tell you it's a dumb question. And then you'll think about it and you go, yeah, it was a really stupid question. I don't know why I asked you that. <laughs> uh, or you learn how to rephrase it, which makes more sense for him. So we have a really great relationship and he just makes sense as the Brewers manager, right? And he grew up here. His dad worked here. I don't think he wants to go anywhere else. I think that uh, they're probably working on some sort of an extension at the moment. I know his contract is over at the end of the 2023 season. Um, it's an interesting place to be not having a contract. You know, in the following year, you almost feel like you're a lame duck. But at the same time, I don't, I don't know if Craig wants to go anywhere else. I, I mean, right. he's pretty locked in. He's got one son in college. He's got another one going to college next year. He still has his two daughters that are making their way towards high school and through high school. Um, so I think he's pretty happy still here in Milwaukee. Um, whether he wants to continue to manage, a different story. But I think he really likes being in the dugout. I think he likes being connected to the players uh, on an everyday basis. He's one of the great managers in the sport, 
of of getting and we talked about it earlier just about getting people to be who they are um putting personalities together he's got a great coaching staff that that he can lean on a lot um I think it would be silly if the Brewers ever let him get out of the building, right? You get, right. you hear those conversations with college kids that are going to on recruiting visits or free agents. You're like, don't let him get out of the building, you know, lock him up. Right. The Brewers would be, I think it would be a silly move if they let him get out of the building. Right. And do you think that's going to happen before a, a, like a player extension? You think first let's, let's take care, let's take care of council and then we'll, then we'll, we'll figure out the players from there. I, th- I think Craig's Craig's extension would be significantly less than less dollars wise than what they're talking about for a potential Corbin Burns or Willie Adamas or Brandon Woodruff. Those would be your top three candidates, I think, for an extension. Um, Craig is not going to cost as much, but he's not going to be cheap. Um, but I, I think that our ownership group, Mark, has done such a great job of keeping the core together. Um, Craig's right at the top. And so he need he needs to be taken care of, and if this is the place he wants to be, uh, I think Mark will make it happen. Fair enough. You mentioned the extensions of the other guys, the uh, the player guys. Do you do you hope? I mean, as as a broadcaster, I mean, you're just kind of you're caught in the middle because you have to report on what it what happens, whether it be you know Josh Hader, where we got a bunch of prospects and stuff like that. Are you caught in the middle a lot of times on these things where it's like? <gasps> Man, I really wanted to see that guy stay here for the foreseeable future. You know what I mean? Sure. Selfishly, you love seeing, you want to see the team succeed first and foremost. And secondly, you root for players. And Hader had been here since you know, I, 2017 is when he made his debut. He was traded to the Brewers in, in 15 uh, in my first year. So um, selfishly, I, he was one of my favorite people to talk to. He's a great guy to talk to. Um, and he was amazing to watch. He was amazing to watch. He's going to continue to be amazing to watch. So that one hurts, but and you and you do get emotionally invested in these people and their families and their kids, and you you watch them grow up, right? So mm-hmm. um, you you are caught in between a little bit. But my job is not. I'm I'm not breaking news. I, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not Jeff Passan or Jeff Passan or whatever fake Twitter handle was invented to to break news for Jeff Passan. Um, that's not what I'm doing. Uh, my job is to report what is factual, what is released by the teams. It's not conjecture. It's this is what is in front of me. This is what is on the paper. This is what's happening right now. Um, it does me no good to try and pontificate or play general manager because that's not my right. job. That's right. not my job. Uh, but do you, you do get caught in, do I want to see an extension for Willie Adamas? Heck yeah. Sign him up. Sign him up for 50 years. I don't. I, I would love to see him here. I think he's great for the city, and he loves the city. Do I want to see Corbin Burns wear nothing but a Brewers jersey? Hell yeah. Same with Brandon Woodruff. I would love to see these guys play for just one team and one team only. Um, but that's not that's not my decision. It's not my dollars that are going and making that decision. Um, but hopefully they come to some accord i think that would be great i think the fans would really appreciate that too right i agree i i'm i'm rooting for it i i'm i said uh matt arnold's tenure as uh gm is going to come down to this i mean like this is kind of he's got to make this team out of this and it kind of it's a bad it's a terrible position to be in because the fans are going to either love you or eat you alive. Yeah, there's no other up- outcome for him, and it's it's just unfortunate, you know. Yeah, it's really hard. And and you go to David Stearns and what he was able to to put together with Matt Arnold over the course of this great run, and sadly, what he's going to be most known for is the Josh Hader trade, right? That's mm-hmm. that's going to be his lasting legacy with this organization. And listen, some moves work, some moves don't. That one didn't work. It did turn into William Contreras, and if William Contreras is a world beater behind the plate and is a multiple-time all-star at the catching position, then, you know, maybe it's not that bad. Yeah, it didn't work out in 2022, but maybe it might be great in the future. Right. Uh, I think Matt's a, Matt's a smart guy. Matt's been around this game for a long time. He's got the scouting background. He has the analytics background. He's going to make the right decision for the organization. Uh, he's going to – Mark Atanasio is going to make the right decision for the organization – um, and fans are just going to have to live with it. They might be pissed off, but that's why they're fans. That's right. 
That's what it's all about. The internet is an ugly place sometimes. The internet sucks most of the time. Let's not <laughs> <laughs> let, no. let's not you know mince words. It sucks most of the time. Yeah, it does. It does. There's there's good and bad, but yeah, yeah. Most of the time it's pretty chunky. Now, yeah. are you excited that you get to now go to all 30? Well, I mean, depending on the games that you are, I would assume you're gonna go to all of them. All yeah, 30. I'll be yeah. I'm, I mean, I do every game, so whether I'm on TV or radio. Uh, yeah, you, unless just flip, you flip aisles basically right right yeah which door Turn am i going to before. yeah do i have to take two extra steps down or do i have to you know wear a sport coat um no I'm, I'm thrilled about the whole balance schedule playing everybody in the league i think that that's a really good thing that major league baseball did to to grow the game and listen i, I know they're doing it so that shohei otani can play in every single market every other year i know that's why they're doing it but you know what man i want to see that unicorn play I got. I was lucky to do an Angel game on national TV last year. I, I, I did a game on Fox down in Houston, and Otani pitched. I was like, "Oh my God! If he gets to pitch this game, and he's going to hit against the Astros, man, this is going to be sweet." And he pitched brilliantly. Um, it was a great game. Mike Trout hit a three-run home run. Like I saw in that game, I saw everything. I went, "This is so cool as a fan." And now that that gets to happen every single year. Uh, I, I'm thrilled. I've been to every major league ballpark with the exception of the new Texas one. And I'm going to check that one off in, in July or August when we go there. I was going to say, didn't you recently, I think you recently finished it too, right? Like I think the Orioles last year or yeah, was Baltimore was my last one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of the older ballparks in, in baseball. And I just never, never done it. So now I got all 30 and now we got the new Texas one. <laughs> Hopefully they'll add some more if they add two expansion teams. That would be fun. Yeah, I, that's a that's a, a horse of a different color. I'm not sure where they're going to go. I mean, I know Nashville and Vegas. And I've been to Charlotte. Charlotte's ballpark is amazing. You'd have to add some seats to it. But they, they, right. there are some great cities that could be potential major league cities. Well, we, we can we can only hope, right? I mean, yeah. I think the expansion in this game just getting better is kind of a, a background wish of – all of us and we're all kind of hoping everything works out with these rules and everything yeah and uh now they're they're trying to make it a more national game with that schedule and bringing yeah. the superstars everywhere so yeah i hope so too i really enjoyed your time thank you so much for coming on um just gonna wrap up real quick and then i'll uh finish up with you and let you yeah my pleasure baseball. man it's, it's great great conversation eric it's always great to talk brewers baseball buddy thank you so much all right, ladies and gentlemen, that was Jeff Levering. Uh, we had a, a great time. Good conversation. Nice guy. What a heck of a nice guy. I, uh, of course, you had personalities. You always expect that out of him, but you never know. Anyways, <laughs> uh, this has been the Miller Park Minute, guys. Every day, 5.30 a.m. Central Standard Time is our upload time. You can watch us on Google, YouTube, everywhere you get your podcast. If you do, please leave a rate and a review. Like, subscribe uh, if you enjoy this content and want to see more Brewers content. You guys have a great rest of your day, and thank you for watching the Miller Park Minute. Go Brewers! Thank you for watching the Miller Park Minute. Go Brewers!